Hello everyone. What we're going to do from uh, this point on in Bio358, um, we're going to be talking about DNA. We're going to talk about the discovery of DNA first and then how it works or how it does, it performs his genetic function. So how does it express the information it's inside itself in the form of producing proteins or how does it deliver that information from one generation to the other one? talking about DNA replication, uh, cell division, and then we'll talk about also the genetics, ultimately uh, how DNA ultimately influence the genetics of uh, the different traits that we pass from one generation to another one. So what we'll talk about first of all in this lecture is how did we get to first discover DNA and its structure, and also how did we get to discover the function of DNA. So how did we get to understand that is this is the molecule that contained the information for any cell to leave and to be passed from one generation to another one. So we'll go mostly through a historical perspective of DNA. Well, first of all, DNA is a fairly recent molecule in terms of um, what we know about it. In fact, it was discovered in the second half of the 1800 by this Swiss scientist, uh, Johann Frederick Mischer, you don't need to remember the names, but um, who is this is a scientist, it's a physician scientist that is interesting on learning the chemistry of what is inside the nucleus, right? And uh, so he was, first of all, interested on in working with lymphocytes. However, you have to understand that in those days, it was not that easy to extract the cells from the blood. Uh, so if you work with a uh, lymphocyte, you would have been limited to a very little number of cells. And so he decided to go with easier cells to retrieve, which are neutrophils, which unfortunately in those days were very easy to retrieve, but from bandages. So he had to go, he was going to hospital, being a physician, he would be collecting these bandages. So, and that's basically coming from pus. Uh, hopefully you're not having lunch while you're watching this uh, lecture. So he was collecting these cells from the past. Pus is very rich in neutrophils. Okay, so he was taking them out, keeping them, washing them uh, with specific solution, and then extracting the nuclei, and most importantly, extracting the molecules inside the nuclei of these cells. And what he observed was really groundbreaking for those days. So he came out with a molecule that from a chemical point of view, that's the molecule he will call nuclein because it was coming from the nucleus. From a molecular point of view, it will be containing nitrogen, phosphorus, but not sulfur. It's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. I know it doesn't sound that shocking probably for you now, but if you think about the structure of the molecules that we have studied in the first part of this course, think about the structure of proteins of the R groups of the amino acid that makes up, make up um, uh, proteins, none of them contain phosphorus. None of them has a phosphate group. Proteins might be phosphorylated later on, but normally they don't contain phosphorus. So clearly this molecule is not proteins. Also, if you think about the lipids, well, they ha can have phosphorus, phospholipids. They can have some nitrogen, some modification, but not really that much, right? They don't really have. So, and these molecules don't contain sulfur. So again, uh, pointing to the fact that they're not proteins. So the combination of what's in there and what's not on there was pointing to a very new molecule, which this scientist called nuclein. Then other chemists start working on this molecule. They kept found better way to purify and study its composition. And a big step was done by this scientist, Phoebus Levine, who actually was the first one to describe um, the building blocks of DNA, which are nucleotides. So he actually discovered that there were in DNA, there were uh, four different type of nucleotides, as you know very well now, and that each nucleotide will be made by a phosphate group, a, um, deoxyribose, and a nitrogenous base. So they were all made by that, but there were four different types. And then he went one step ahead, Phoebus Levine, that trying to understand how would these nucleotides, these building blocks, bind together to form DNA. And what he came out with is what you can see here on the right side, 
ultimately came out with the concept of the phosphodiester bond. He got it wrong because if you look, what he came out with, it was with a um, um, tetrahedral structure with all four different nucleotides bound together through still this phosphodiester bond, still involved in the carbon five and the carbon three of the oxyribose. So it wasn't too far off from the real bond. We know now that these nucleotides form linear strands, not circular molecules like this. But the concept of phosphodiester bond, again, was uh, coming from the study of this scientist here. Now, neither of these scientists that we talked about until now understood the function of DNA. Um, they described the chemistry, but they didn't know what it was. And until pretty much the first half of 1900, you gotta think people were seeing now this new molecule coming out. However, this molecule was made only by four nucleotides. Whereas they knew that proteins that were made by several more amino acids, there are 20 of them in nature. And so because of the complexity of what protein can form with these 20 uh, components, right? Compared to the four nucleotides, they, could, they were actually thinking that proteins could have been the genetic material. They could have contained much more information. Think about, for example, if you have to work with a 20 letter alphabet versus a four letter alphabet, you can immediately see how much more complex can be the language that you can come out with 20 letter, letters compared to four letters. Same thing here. They were thinking, well, with 20 amino acids, you can come out with much more information, much more complex language, right? Which ultimately that's what genetic information is compared to what you could come up with four nucleotides. And here you can see how many uh, different um, combination you can get with proteins and DNA, just to give you a sense of the complexity you can get. So they were really wrong. They thought the proteins were the molecules that would contain the genetic information. How did you get to know that instead was DNA containing this information? Through a series of other experiments. And I like talking about them because particularly this one right here, because first of all, are very, they're an excellent example of simple overall science with a conclusion that come out from unexpected results, like in this case right here. So first experiment we'll talk about here, Fred Griffith. This is actually a physician that couldn't care less about DNA. In fact, what he was working on he was working on a vaccine for these uh, bacteria called streptococcus pneumonia, which was causing a lot of death in those days, the first half of 1900s, uh, for pneumonia, causes pneumonia and was killing a lot of people. So he's trying to make a vaccine. And as you know, vaccine, they, they are usually made nowadays, and even in those days, with, you can make them with either something that simulates the pathogen you're trying to immunize a person for, or with the same pathogen that has been made inactive. Okay. And so in this case, when it comes to streptococcus pneumonia, they knew that there were two different types of uh, strands. One would refer to as the rough strand and one the smooth strand, which is the naming was coming just simply from their, their appearance under the microscope. The rough one has a rough appearance the smooth one has a nice and smooth surface on the outside. And so they knew that they were, they had different uh, virulence overall, these two type of, of um, strands. And so first step, he wants to make a vaccine. And so he's gonna work not in humans, but he's gonna work in animals. And he wants to test these two strands and see which one will work well to make a vaccine. First thing you wanna know is which one is safe, right? And so what he does, very first experiment he does, he takes bacteria of the rough, uh, rough strand, injects them in mice. And what he sees is that even when injects in mice, the mice are doing very well. They stay alive. They don't die. And it's not because they kill these uh, bacteria. In fact, if he takes the blood out, he can still find live R cells in the circulation. So showing clearly that the R strain is non-pathogenic. Great, if you wanna make a vaccine. And then if he does the same thing with the S strains, <clears throat> what he sees instead is that the S strain actually is killing the mice. Not a good thing. You don't want to have something that is pathogenic if you wanna inject it 
in a person. You don't want to kill this person, right? So you assume that the mouse is going to act like a person in this case. And so all we see is that the S strand is very pathogenic, kills the mice, and it reproduces in their blood. In fact, it can extract S cells from the blood. So his conclusion is that, okay, the R strand is non-pathogenic, could be used for a vaccine. The S strand could not be used as is. However, in the next step, what he thinks is that, okay, can I make this S strand in some way usable to produce a vaccine? And as they do now, you can inactivate a virus or a bacteria in this case by doing different treatments. And so you inactivate it and you can still inject it inside a person and produce an immune response. He's thinking of doing the same thing. So in the next step, it takes these S strands, first of all, and it inactivates it by using heat. It takes very high heat, he knows it's killing all of these uh, bacteria and injects them into the mice. So that's the first thing he's going to do. He takes heat inactivated S, cell, S cells, injects them into mice, and what he sees is that indeed now heat inactivates these S cells, it kills them, it kills the, the sorry, it doesn't kill the mice anymore. The mice stay alive, so the S cells have gone from pathogenic to non pathogenic through the heat treatment, right? And there are no S cells because the S cells are dead. They're not replicated in the mice blood. Great. Heat can kill the S cells. S cells could be used to make a vaccine. So now you have live R cells that you can use and heat inactivated S cells that could be used to make a vaccine as well. Both of them would be non pathogenic. So the next thing has in mind, say, great. Can I make an even more powerful vaccine by mixing the live R strand? with the heat killed estes uh, strain. So both of them are non-pathogenic. If I put them together, I should get an amazing vaccine, right? He does that, and to his surprise, completely unexpected, he sees that if you inject the um, R strain, non-pathogenic per se, with the heat inactivated S cells, which should be non-pathogenic, now the mice die. You don't expect that. You would expect them to be alive. Not only that, but you see also that now, instead of any R cells, which you would expect, because these are the live cells you're injecting, it gets S cells reproducing in the mouse. As if something had transferred from the dead or heat killed S cells to the R cell. So there must be something moving from the S cells to the R cells. So these unexpected result would um, basically point to the fact that there might be something, some genetic material, you can use the word now, that transfer the information from the dead S cells to the live R cells, transforming them into S cells. This is a picture that tells exactly the same thing. I'll repeat it over and over. It's a good way to understand these experiments. So if it takes now the heat kill S cells, inject them into mice, they're non-pathogenic. Not only that, but it doesn't find any S cell in the blood. But if it mixes them with the R cells, now the same heat kill S cells mixed with the R cells, both of them should be non-pathogenic, should not kill the mouse. But when they're injected together, they kill the mouse. Not only that, but the live R cells are now found in the blood. Instead, it finds live S cells, cells that should be dead. So what it points to is that there might be something moving from the S cells to the R cell, transforming them into live S cells. And so this summarizes the same thing. So if you combine them together at this point, you have dead mice with something that clearly is going from the S cells to the R cell, converting them into S cells. What is this? Well, Griffith could not answer this question. He didn't know what was passing from the S cells to the R cell, transforming them into R cells, S cells, sorry. Who really got come out with this answer is this other sound scientist, a Canadian scientist, his name is Oswald Avery. It, towards the mid of 1900. So he continued the experiment. However, what he was now interested on in finding out is what is, which molecule is actually 
transferring from the S cells, converting the R cell into the S cells. And so they already know all these molecules, proteins, lipid, nucleic acids, so DNA, RNA. And so what he thought of was that, okay, instead of using full S cells, I can use an extract which contains all of these molecules, right? And then slowly I narrowed down to which one it could be. And so what first thing experiment it did, it took a liquid extra from the S cells, it put them together with the R cells, and it was getting exactly the same results here. So instead of using full S cells, at this point is using um, um, extract with uh, DNA, RNA, proteins in there, and this is happening still. So one of these molecules is indeed responsible for the transformation. Now it wants to narrow down. So is it protein? Is it lipid? Is it RNA? Or is it DNA? And so what it does, it does the same experiment it did before, taking this liquid extract, but now in some of this preparation, it adds some enzymes that degrade specifically some of the mo these, um, these molecules. So in some experiment, it uses proteases. These are molecules that do degrade proteins. So you get rid of the proteins. You're still left with lipids, uh, RNA, DNA, and so on. Now, in the other uses lipases that get rid of lipids, degrades all lipids, so you're left with proteins, DNA, and RNA, or RNases, and so on, and DNases in other. So selectively, it has different batches of these extracts from S cells missing one of the specific molecules. And then it tests them all. And so what it sees, just going straight to the picture here, is that now, if it takes R cells, non-pathogenic R cells, and now it mixes them with one extra that has been treated with DNAs, so which has lipids, um, proteins, RNA, but it doesn't have DNA. Now, this transformation process of R cell doesn't happen anymore. In fact, if you inject this mixture into mice, now the mice don't die anymore. They stay alive and there are no S cells found. Instead, if you remove any of the other molecules, except for DNA, so if you treat this extra with lipases, or you get little lipids, proteins with proteases, and RNA with RNases, at this point, DNA is still present. Mix this extract together with the R cells, now the R cells still transform into S cells and they kill the mouse. So clearly pointing to the fact that it's DNA, ultimately the molecule that is transferring from the S cells into the R cell, allowing them to transform. So pointing to the fact that DNA might contain information. DNA is a genetic molecule. Another experiment that showed how DNA contains actually the genetic material also to, uh, to transfer that information from one generation to another one is, was done in this experiment by Hershey and Chase one year before the discovery of the DNA structure. And in this case, these scientists were working very clever. They were working with a very simple system, which is the bacteriophage T2. This is basically like a virus, okay? Uh, but instead of infecting um, animals and so on, is infecting bacteria of the strain E. coli. Why were they interested in working with this bacteriophage? Is because this is a very simple system. In fact, this bacteriophage, if you look at the structure, all they're made of is a bunch of proteins that form the capsid and the st structure here responsible for the anchoring to the bacterium and DNA inside the capsid here. That's all they have, DNA and proteins. No lipids, no RNA, nothing else, okay? Very simple. Now, it was known that these bacteria, the way, so these uh, bacteria phages, the way they replicate is by binding to bacteria and injecting something inside this bacteria. So there is something that contains some genetic information that gets injected into the bacteria. Once that gets injected inside here, that molecule has all the information to get the bacteria to produce new bacteria phages, which then will be released. So something is transferring either DNA or proteins into the bacteria 
and this is the molecule that contains the genetic information to make the next generation of bacteriophages. Which one is that? Well, how did they do their experiment? Well, in the first step, they first um, developed two different batches, so two different samples, let's take that way, of bacteriophage T2, one of them with DNA made radioactive, the other one with only proteins made radioactive. How do they do them? Well, it's very simple to do. All you have to do is take the bacteriophage, you divide it into two different samples, separate samples, you keep them separate. And in one case, you get it to grow in the presence of bacteria, obviously, to replicate, in the presence of this radioactive form of phosphorus, P32. What happens is that now the bacteria that are here, they will take P32 in as any phosphorus and they will integrate in any molecule that they have, including the molecule, the new molecules or the new um, bacteriophages that will be producing after you infect them with the phage T2. If you then remove the bacteria, you purify your bacteriophage done here, these bacteriophages here now, they would have only DNA. Phosphorus is present only in DNA, if you remember, not in proteins. So they would have only radioactive DNA, but no radioactive proteins. So that's what you call cold proteins. Radioactive DNA, but not proteins. The opposite is if you do the same thing using instead of P32, you use a radioactive uh, isotope of sulfur, which is S35. Sulfur is found in proteins, but not DNA. So if here you have the bacteria, they take in the sulfur, radioactive sulfur, and when they're producing more bacteriophage here, they incorporate this radioactive isotope in the proteins of the bacteriophage as well. So then you separate the bacteria, you take away all the remaining radioactivity, and you will come out with a batch with a sample of bacteriophage, which at this point would have cold DNA, so no radioactive DNA, but radioactive proteins. So now you have a sample of bacteriophage with radioactive DNA and one with radioactive um, proteins. You keep them nicely separated. So how do they use these two samples here now? Uh, they use them to do the following experiment. So they do two infection experiments separate. In one of them, they take some E. coli and infect them only with the bacteria with the radioactive proteins. Sorry, with the bacteriophage with the radioactive proteins. In the other one, they do the same thing, but instead they use the bacteriophage with only radioactive DNA. Now, they put them together, so something gets injected. No matter what is the phage you have, something must get injected here. So if now is the proteins that get injected into the bacteria, you would expect that some of this radioactivity would transfer from the bacteriophage to the inside of the bacteria, right? Then what you would expect is that once you remove the bacteriophage from being attached to them, and you can do that, you shake them, okay? And then you centrifuge, you take the bacteria. So if any of the protein from the bacteriophage was transferred into the, the um, bacteria, the bacteria should now be radioactive, right? However, what they observe is that the bacteria were not getting radioactive. So if you incubate them with phage that has radioactive proteins, you don't have any transfer of radioactivity from the phage to the inside of the bacteria, which shows you that basically the proteins are not coming in. And therefore, most likely proteins are not the genetic, uh, the, the molecule containing genetic information. Instead, if you use the phage that contains the DNA, what they saw during the same experiment, they saw that, in fact, there is transfer of radioactivity from the phage into the bacteria. So if you put them together and then you remove the phage that were attached here, now you take only the bacteria, you measure if there is radioactivity, in fact, there is a radioactivity. And in this case, this radioactivity can only be coming from DNA. So DNA, not proteins, are transferred from the bacteriophage into the bacteria, meaning that the DNA should be the molecule that contains the genetic information 
to produce new bacteriophage. Okay, so now we have two sets of experiments that show that DNA is the genetic molecule that contains that information to execute information within the same organism or even to transfer to the next generation as this experiment is shown here. Now, moving on to, so this is how DNA was dis discovered and its function as well. Let's move on now to how the structure of DNA was discovered. So we already know, scientists knew that there was this molecule nuclein that was made of uh, four different nucleotides. How did we get from there to the double helix? Well, if you recall, we know that DNA is made by a single strand nowadays, and it contains four different nitrogenous bases, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Just reminding you here some concept. If you remember, this nitrogenous base can be divided into purine, which would contain two rings, and adenine and guanine are purines, or pyrimidines. Thymine and cytosine are pyrimidines, and they both contain a single uh, ring right there. Now, why do I tell you this so you understand the next experiment? So, some a scientist named Edwin Chargos, he was actually studying the composition of this nucleobase found in DNA. So he was taking different samples uh, from human sperm, uh, different, different, whatever sample was coming into his hands, pretty much. It will be analyzing the DNA in terms of composition of this nitrogenous base. And what he observed it was that no matter what species or where you get it from, they all have similarities. What are the similarities? Is that if you take the number of purines, so adenine plus guanine, they're always, you put them together, they always give you the same number than thymine and cytosine. Now, not only that, but you observe too. So this plus this, basically a adenine plus guanine will always give you 50% of the nitrogenous bases and same timing and cytosine, right? Now, not only that, but then you observe that the amount of adenine would always be equal to the amount of timing. And the same thing for the amount of guanine will be always equal to the amount of cytosine. For example, if you have that, this will be 100, right? You have 15% that is adenine, timing will be 15%. And then 35% will be guanine, 35% will be cytosine. The same for all organisms. So if it was 5%, this will be 5%, 45 and 45. So all organisms would have an equal amount of purines and pyrimidines with adenine always equal to thymine and guanine equal to cytosine. However, the amount of adenine or thymine would always be different than the one that guanine and cytosine or cytosine. This is referred to as the Chargas plural. If you think this is the base of the base pairing, right? When you write a strand of DNA, let's say A, C, C, T, because of this rule, you immediately know what is in the other strand. So if it's A, C, C, T, you know that in the other strands, you would have thymine, guanine, guanine, adenine, right? just by using this rule, because you know that for every adenine, there's a way of thymine. For every guanosine, there is a cytosine. Now, together with this, other scientists, they start seeing that uh, indeed there were these, poly, uh, these um, um, uh, nucleotides were joined by phosphodiester bonds, forming linear strands, in this case, not circular one, like Levine had suggested. And, uh, and, um, um, I was going to say here, sorry, I got lost here, and that these actually strain would have a specific orientation with a phosphate group in five prime and an hydroxy group on the three prime. Then, so they would have their polarity, five prime to three prime, as I mentioned before. And now we're getting to the final structure, and that's where Watson and Creek comes in. Watson and Creek, as you know, are the scientists that are credited for the discovery of the structure of DNA, overall structure, or the structure, the double helix structure of DNA. And in reality, though, they never really did their own experiments. <laughs> These were amazing scientists that could actually put together 
that puzzle me by the results of the different experiments that I just mentioned to you. The Chargaff's rule and uh, the fact that the, the strands had a specific orientation with the nitrogenous base sticking out and so on. Together with that also, they put all this data that I just mentioned with particularly an extra data that was shown to them by Wilkins. The data was actually generated by Franklin, a student in Wilkins, um, a technician actually in Wilkins lab, that what I was doing, she was doing the X-ray diffraction studies of crystallized DNA. So basically what she was doing is this experiment. So she was taking DNA and bombarding it with X-rays. What she's doing is exactly what is done when you go and take an X-ray, for example, of your bones. You get bombarded with X-rays. And what happens is that the X-rays, they form a beam, and then whenever they hit something with a certain density, they get deflected. Right? And you can see how it gets deflected by putting a film behind it. That's what they do when you do your x-rays. They put a film behind you, right, or whatever area in your body they're taking an x-ray of, and they take a picture of how these x-rays were deflected. So they can see uh, where the bone can be cracked. It will be deflected differently because now there is a fracture there. Same thing here with DNA. Now, if you do it with DNA, wherever there are atoms in the DNA, and based on the way that they are attached to each other, the X-ray will be deflected in a certain angle. Keep in mind, they were already doing these studies with proteins, and they had already discovered the alpha helix, do you remember the secondary structure of proteins, exactly by doing this. And so when Watson and Crick were shown by uh, Wilkins here, these data generated by Franklin here, they saw this picture here. As soon as they saw it, bing, they got the idea. This pattern here was very similar to what was seen indeed in the alpha helix of protein, showing that in this case too, there could be an alpha helix. The same rotation, right-handed. Not only that, but just by looking at this, so this pattern right here tells you that there is an alpha helix. Not only, but if you look here, you can probably see also that it's repeated. This pattern indeed looks repeated, which means that there is an alpha helix with this structure repeated over and over. We know if you go through the alpha helix, you see that this structure indeed keeps being repeated. It's not just like in protein, there may be an alpha helix and then you have a beta bleeding sheet or other secondary structures. Here, this structure is repeated over and over and over. And so by taking this, putting everything together and playing like little kids overall, uh, using carbon uh, models and metal plates to simulate the bases. This is actually um, a similar model that they would use. See, this will be actually metal plates uh, simulating uh, purines in this case, these pyrimidines here. So we play with them. What they came out indeed was with the uh, right-handed double helix structure of DNA. So they came out, they understood that DNA will be forming an alpha helix. Not only that, that this alpha helix will be repeated, plus they got many other information out of this, which we won't discuss here in um, just to save time. But what they figured out is how do you can how can you get that double helix? You can get it only through purine and pyrimidine pair. So where you basically have one base with two rings pairing with one with uh, one ring. You put in together the Chargaff's rule, indeed they came out with the fact that now you have a double helix formed by two strands. They are held together by the nitrogenous base being exactly on the same level, on the same plane. And then you have the adenine forms two hydrogen bonds with thymine, and this is based on the elements that you would have here on these plates. That's the only way you can really fit them and get them to actually bind together. And the same thing, guanine will be just matching with cytosine, holding together these two strands, but in this case, with three um, hydrogen bonds. Other information that they got from the X-ray was that indeed, 
when you look at the alpha helix, this alpha helix, the spacing between the backbones here are not always the same. So you have what you call a minor groove and a larger groove. Again, you could see it, we won't discuss that. Um, but is um, you could see it from the x-ray even that information. So just by getting all these results from different people playing around with some bases made of cardboard and metal, they came out with this structure, the, the right-handed double helix structure where you have two anti-parallel strand of DNA. So one going five prime to three prime, the other one three prime to five primes held together. And that's the only way you can squeeze them together held together through hydrogen uh, bonds between a purine and a pyrimidine, between adenine and thymine, or cytosine and guanine, which gives origin to a minor groove and a major groove in this structure, which is repeated over and over and over. And so for this discovery, they finally, about 10 years later, they got uh, the Nobel Prize, uh, while unfortunately, the person that really generated the most important data, so Rosalind Franklin died of cancer, not surprisingly, being bombarded by x-rays during her own experiment. So in summary, what did we discuss in this lecture? Well, we talked about two important things. How was DNA discovered and how the genetic function of DNA was discovered? So going not really in the order, the full order that I follow, but we did talk about how DNA was discovered first as nuclein, what the Swiss scientist that was studying um, the um, uh, material found in the nuclei, then the structure of nucleotides, the phosphodiester and the bonds between them by Levine, the Chargaff rule. Then we talk about the DNA crystallography data generated by Franklin, and then how Watson and Crick basically they put everything together, coming with the double helix structure of DNA. And then we talked also about the key experiments. There are other experiments there, but the key experiments that ultimately led to understand how DNA is that molecule that contains the genetic information for organism to function, but also to produce new generations. So we talked about the experiment done by Griffin first and Avery, and then the experiment done by Hershey and Chase with the bacterial phage 